Number three, the Red Square Bomber. On New Year's Eve 2011, thousands of people plan to visit Red Square in Moscow, Russia, which is a popular site for New Year's Eve festivities. Little do these people know, but a militant jihadist organization, possibly the Caucasus Emirate, was planning to send a suicide bomber to kill and injure as many people as possible in Red Square. The plan was to have the woman wear an explosive belt and have her mingle among the crowd. A fellow terrorist was going to watch her and then he was going to detonate the belt by sending a text message to a phone that was the detonator for the belt. When constructing these bombs, the bomb makers usually just buy cheap cell phones. Also, most of the time, they don't keep the phone attached to the explosives, or at the very least, they keep the phone turned off until it's needed. Hours before the planned attack, the woman and two of her handlers were waiting in a safe house. For some reason, the phone was on and it was attached to the explosive belt. Then, to the shock of all three of them, the mobile carrier sent a spam text message saying Happy New Year. The text message caused the belt to detonate. The proposed suicide bomber was killed in the blast and her two handlers fled the safe house. Luckily, thanks to the spam text message, no one else was hurt. The identity of the would-be suicide bomber has never been made public. Number 2. Troy Leon Gregg On November 21st, 1973, 25-year-old Troy Leon Gregg was hitchhiking with his companion, 16-year-old Floyd Ralford Allen. They were in Florida, and they were traveling north. They were picked up by 44-year-old Fred Edward Simmons and 37-year-old Bob Derwood Moore. Gregg took over driving, and Simmons and Moore started drinking. At some point, they picked up another hitchhiker, and then a few hours later, they dropped him off. Later that day, they were in Gwinnett County, Georgia, and Simmons and Moore needed a bathroom break. As the two men were walking out of the bathroom at a rest stop, Greg opened fire on them with a 25 caliber automatic pistol. The two men tried to find cover in a drainage ditch, but Greg jumped in and shot them at point blank range. After killing the men, Greg and Allen stole what money the two men had, then got into their car and drove off. Two days later, the hitchhiker that had been riding with them read about the murders in the newspaper, and he knew that Greg and Allen were heading to Asheville, North Carolina. He called the police and told them to look for Greg and Allen in Asheville. The police in Asheville kept an eye out for the stolen car and it wasn't long before Greg and Allen were arrested. Greg was convicted of murder, and he was sentenced to death. Greg appealed his death sentence, but he lost the appeal. July 29, 1980, was set as Greg's date with the electric chair. The day before he was set to be executed, Greg and three other inmates escaped from death row. They had saw the bars of a cell, and then using stolen guard outfits, they walked away from the prison. Within 48 hours of the escape, three of the men were recaptured. Greg was not one of those men. Instead, his badly beaten body was pulled from a lake. It turned out that the night after Greg escaped, which was the day he was supposed to be executed, he went to a biker bar. He was apparently rude to a female employee, a James Horn, a 30-year-old outlaw biker who went by the nickname Butch, took exception to this. On the day that he should have died in the electric chair, Horn beat Greg unmercifully. When Horn was finished beating Greg, he realized that Greg wasn't breathing. So he dumped Greg's battered body into a lake that was near the bar. Horn was charged with second-degree murder but the results of those charges could not be found. Number 1. Malignado 
36-year-old Brenda Schaefer lived with her parents in St. Matthews, Kentucky. She worked as a nursing assistant and she was engaged to be married. At 3 p.m. on September 24, 1988, she left her parents' home to go on a date with her fiancé. Schaefer told her parents that she would be coming home that night. When she didn't return home, her parents called her fiancé, Malignado. He told them that she left his place a few hours earlier, around 11.30, he had no idea where she was. Ignado then called the police. Shaver's car was found a few hours later. It was found abandoned on the side of the road, about half a mile from her house. Her right rear tire was flat, and the car had been vandalized. A window had been smashed, and the car radio was missing. After a few days, Schaefer was still missing, and her family told the police to investigate Ignato. They said that Ignato was abusive and controlling, and Schaefer was planning on leaving him. The police did investigate Ignato, but they couldn't find any evidence that he had anything to do with her disappearance. Ten months after Schaefer disappeared, no trace of her had been found. Ignato remained the police's prime suspect, and Ignato had remained adamant they had nothing to do with Schaefer's disappearance. He even volunteered to testify in front of the grand jury. The district attorney decided to take him up on his offer. In his testimony, Ignato mentioned a woman named Marianne Shore. He said that he and Shore started dating a month after Schaefer went missing. The district attorney thought that this was unusual, so he called Shore to testify. After a few questions, she was severely rattled, and she even ran away from the witness stand. After a few days of testifying, Shore and her lawyer approached the district attorney. Shore said that she and Ignato had been having an affair before Schaefer went missing. Instead of leaving Schaefer, Ignato said that he wanted to kill her. For several weeks, she and Ignato worked on a plan on how they would torture and kill her. They decided the best place to do it was in Shore's home. They did tests in her house to see if anyone would hear screaming if they were standing outside. It turned out that when they were in the living room, no one outside would be able to hear someone scream. Shore said that on the day that Schaefer went missing, Schaefer went over to Ignato's home. He pulled a gun on her and then tied her up and gagged her. He put her in the trunk of his car and drove to Shore's house. In the living room, he bound Schaefer to a glass top coffee table. Before the murder, Ignato and Shore wrote out a plan on how they wanted to rape, torture, and eventually murder Schaefer. They followed their step-by-step -step plan, checking off each item as they went, and Shore took photographs of the sexual assault and torture. Ignato finally killed her with chloroform. The police asked Shore for the photographs of the torture, but she said she didn't have them. She said that Ignato took the rolls of film, and she had no idea where they were. But Shore did have something to share that would prove she was telling the truth. She knew where Schaefer's body was buried. She told the police the body was buried in a pre-dug grave in the woods behind her house. Sixteen months after she went missing, the police found Schaefer's body exactly where Shore said it would be. The police had Shore wear a wire and she recorded a conversation with Ignato. During the conversation, he talks about the burial site. Ignato was arrested and was charged with Barbara Schaefer's murder. Only two things tie Ignato to the murder. The first was the conversation that was recorded when Shore wore the wire, and the second was Shore's testimony. But the case wasn't a slam dunk for the district attorney. The first problem was that there was no physical evidence that connected Ignato to the murder. 
Another problem was the quality of the audio of Shore Nignato's conversation about a burial site. Some of the key parts of their conversation were inaudible. When some members of the jury heard the recording, they didn't think that Ignato was talking about a buried body. Instead, they thought he was talking about a buried safe, which had stolen items in it. The third problem with the district attorney's case was Marianne Shore. When Shore testified, she wore a short and revealing skirt. She also giggled while she testified. The jury disliked her and didn't believe her testimony. They thought it was more likely that she killed Schaefer because she was jealous. As a result of all these problems, Ignato was acquitted of murder. He walked out of the courtroom a free man. After the verdict, the judge who presided over the case wrote a letter to Schaefer's father. In the letter, he blasted the jury's decision. He closed the letter by writing, whether in this world or another, one day, justice will be done. While Ignato walked on the murder, Shore, who took a plea deal to testify against Ignato, was sentenced to the maximum, five years in prison. Six months after Ignato was acquitted, a carpet layer was working on the house where Ignato lived at the time of the murder. Under some old carpet, he found a bag of jewelry that he contacted the police. The jewelry belonged to Barbara Schaefer and it had not been seen since she went missing. The police searched the rest of the house and they found three undeveloped rolls of film. They had the photographs developed, over a hundred in all, and they were horrifying. They depicted exactly what Marianne Shore said happened to Schaefer. In many of the photographs, Schaefer is bound to a glass top coffee table. Ignato's face wasn't in any of the photographs, but the police were able to match his body to the man in the photographs. After the photographs were found, Ignato was arrested. Then, while standing in front of a judge, Ignato confessed to torturing, raping, and murdering Barbara Schaefer. After he confessed, he turned to Schaefer's family and said that she died peacefully. Her family was beyond disgusted. Unfortunately, there was not much the police or the district attorney could do because Ignato had already been acquitted of Schaefer's murder. If they charged him again, it would have been double jeopardy. All they could do was charge him with perjury. In 1992, he pleaded guilty to those charges, and he was sentenced to nine years in prison. Ignato, who bound his fiance to a glass top coffee table, and then tortured, raved, and murdered her, while his mistress took pictures of the rape and torture, only ended up serving five years in jail. In September 2008, Ignato had been out of prison for almost two years. On September 1st, Ignato, who was 70, fell into a glass top coffee table. His head and arms were cut severely by the broken glass. There were signs that he desperately tried to crawl for help but his attempts were unsuccessful. He bled to death all alone in his apartment. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merchandise, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.